All right, everyone. It's a little bit after 7 p.m., so we'll get started. Um, my name is Briley Lewis. I'm a third year grad student here at UCLA in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Um, and what I do is I study exoplanets, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'll also be looking at the chat throughout the show, so if you have questions, feel free to throw them in. I'm happy to answer. Um, all right, let's get started. So I want you to imagine an exoplanet. When you think of a planet around another star, what, what do you see? What comes into your mind? Um, I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about this. Like really imagine in detail. What does this world look like? Ah, oh no, spoilers. That's what happens when you have 30 windows open for streaming. All right, hopefully you've had a chance to think about this by now. So I would bet that the image that came into your mind was something like what I accidentally showed you, which is this. So I would think that when you think of an exoplanet, you would think of, you know, these pictures that we see as artist renditions um, that are often on headlines about exoplanets and planets um, around other stars and just generally the exciting new stuff. They always show beautiful artist renditions like this. Um, or you might think of one of the planets in our own solar system. This makes sense. We're familiar with what we've seen. So we're the most familiar with the planets in our solar system. Um, and even some of these artist renditions are often loosely based on solar system planets. Like this one in the upper right, it's basically a purple Saturn. A lot of the exoplanet images we see are, you know, things that look a lot like Jupiter, but with different colors, um, because these are our reference points or the things in the solar system. But what does an exoplanet actually look like if you were to look at it through a telescope? It turns out, looks nothing like those artist renditions. This is what an exoplanet actually looks like when you try to image it. So each lettered dot in this picture is actually a real exoplanet that has been imaged with a telescope. So tonight I'll be telling you about how we actually do this. It's not straightforward, like, you know, you can see Saturn if you just take a telescope, point it at Saturn and look through it, you'll very clearly see, you know, the planet and its rings. Um, but taking pictures of these exoplanets is much, much, much harder. So a disclaimer, this is not how we found most of the exoplanets we know of. A lot of the headlines you see about like Earth 2.0, that's not from taking pictures like this. Those are from other things called the transit method and the radial velocity method, um, where you're actually looking at the star the planet is around and then indirectly inferring that there's a planet there. Um, so this is not how we've found the bulk of the exoplanets we know of, but we have found some this way, and it's gonna be a really important technique as we go forward in the next decades. So I said this is a really hard problem. So why is it so hard? So first off, we have an atmosphere that gets in the way. So Earth's atmosphere is constantly moving and changing. And you know you can think of if you are on a really hot day and you see a little like, mirage in a, in a parking lot or in a desert, um, that's just air moving. So the atmosphere is really lumpy and bumpy and not perfect. Um, the second part is exoplanets are absolutely tiny compared to the big stars they orbit around. Um, and they're very far away from us, which means that they are extra, extra faint. So the further away something is, the dimmer it appears to us on Earth. Um, and that makes for something really hard. Fainter thing, harder to see. And then to make things worse, not only are they faint, but they also orbit around stars, which are super bright. So you could compare this problem to taking a photo of a firefly, but that firefly is buzzing around the bright lights of Las Vegas, and you're trying to take the picture of this firefly from Los Angeles. So not exactly an easy problem here, um, but let's tackle each of these issues one by one to see how we can get over this with technology. A little digression first. If it's so hard, why do we want to do this in the first place? Like I said that we found a bunch of planets through other ways, so why is this worthwhile in the first place? Um, why is it worth the effort that it would take to do this? So first off, imaging planets can actually find bigger, far out planets that those other techniques can't. So each technique has limitations um, of like what the technology is sensitive to, and it turns out that imaging can look at 
these really far out from their star, really high mass planets, um, things like, you know, super Jupiter, so things that are bigger than Jupiter, and hopefully even down to things that are Jupiter size. Um, so this is how we can investigate the outer solar system. With imaging, we can also see what planets are made of. So imaging is one way of getting spectra, so taking the light from this planet, breaking it up into its component colors so that we can see um, different absorption lines that correspond to different elements. Um, and so getting spectra is important because it's what's going to tell us about composition. Um, and imaging is one way we can do that. So this also like would tell us a lot about planet formation and what the atmosphere is like and what the planet's made of. And importantly, we're gonna need spectra to actually answer questions about habitability. So whether a planet could support life or not, or even whether it has life or not. Another cool thing with imaging is you can actually directly see the orbits of the planets. So with other indirect methods, you are trying to, you know, see all these signals and disentangle them to figure out what these different orbits of these planets are. But with imaging, it's as simple as plainly seeing it. So this is that planetary system that I showed in the intro slide. Uh, it's called HR 8799 with planets B, C, D, and E. Um, and you can actually see them over the years go around in their orbits. So they're obviously, you know, taking more than an Earth year to go around their star. Makes sense. These are really far out planets, kind of like our outer solar system that takes many, many Earth years to go around their star. But it's cool that you can see them, even over the course of like the six years of this image. So now that we have some motivation, let's get back to how we can actually do all this. So first off, we've got that problem with Earth's atmosphere I mentioned. So the atmosphere is pretty much, you know, always moving and there's different temperatures at different parts and causing all those lumps that I said. So when you look at this video of the moon, you can really clearly see how your image of the moon isn't quite steady and isn't as, you know, resolved as it could be because you're getting, seeing all these fluctuations of the Earth's atmosphere in front of it. So this is called turbulence and it pretty much happens when there's different um, temperatures of air that make the light refract, refract through it differently. Um, so a way to imagine this is you've got a distant object like a star and then you've got your incoming light waves from that star. And when they're coming towards us, they're pretty much perfect plane waves, just traveling through the vacuum of space. But then they hit the atmosphere and all this turbulence. And then what comes out of that is a wave front with a bunch of airs that's coming to our telescopes. We have that lumpy wave front that's gonna end up with that blurry image um, like we saw in the video. So we need to fix that lumpy wave front. So this is problem one, dealing with the atmosphere. So we have something called adaptive optics that pretty much senses that incoming lumpy wave front and then tells a mirror how to move to actually correct for it. So these things called deformable mirrors, which are exactly what they sound like. They're a mirror that can actually move because there's a bunch of little actuators below it, you know, pressing up in different parts in order to move it around. Um, and that's correcting for these lumps so that you can have that plain, like flat wave front that would make a clear crisp image actually go on to your detectors in your telescope. So adaptive optics is how we deal with the atmosphere. And it's really clear how this gives us so much sharper images. So this is an image from the Galactic Center group at UCLA um, who famously discovers Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And they have this GIF that's showing the big difference, big, big difference between what this part of the galactic center looks like without adaptive optics versus what it looks like with adaptive optics. You can see how those big blurry stars get much clearer and crisper, and you can actually resolve more of them, including the small faint ones. So this is important for studying the galactic center, and it's also really important for studying exoplanets. So our next problem is dealing with all that starlight. So I mentioned that we are, you know, in we're looking at these little planets that are small and faint compared to a really big, bright star. So the way we deal with this is what's called a coronagraph. So these were originally used to look at the sun's corona, so its outer layers. It's called a coronagraph because you're blocking out that inner starlight in order to see the fainter corona around it. So we can use this same idea for exoplanets where you just want to block out 
the main star so you can see the fainter planets around it. So this is a simulation of what the solar system would look like from 30 light years away. So without a coronagraph blocking out the bulk of the star's light, you would have no chance of seeing any planets, absolutely none. So that's what's shown on the left. And then with a coronagraph, you actually might be able to see Saturn and Jupiter. So the coronagraph makes a really big difference and is one of the key parts of how we can see exoplanets and actually image them. And then if you notice in the in the images before, there's, oh no. Um, in the images before, there's still all of this extra light here, all this noise from when you block out the star. So some of that starlight still gets through and this is what we call speckle noise. So that's something we have to get rid of. So the last step is taking out the rest of the speckles. So since we, we know that there is a way of distinguishing the speckles, so the light from the starlight, from the light from the planet, so what we do is make a model of that noise and then subtract it from the data in order to just get the signals of the planets. So this is another image of um, HR 8799, that first planetary system I showed, just from a different observation. And you can see there's all these little tiny um, planets that you can see now that we've removed the rest of the noise in this image. So this is only generally one way of processing the data. The big takeaway is even after you do all the stuff with your actual physical optics in your telescope, there's a bunch left to do in data processing, which is a really important part of this entire, you know, effort. Um, it's actually also what I worked on for my first two years of grad school was data processing for this kind of imaging. So there are some limits to exoplanet imaging. So we already talked about the advantages, but on the flip side, those are also kind of its limits. So we can only see these planets at large separations. So they have to be far away from their star where they're not gonna get drowned out by that starlight. Um, and we can also only see planets that are really, really, really large. So right now the smallest planet we've imaged is two times the mass of Jupiter. So we haven't even been able to see anything as small as Jupiter, which is the biggest planet in our solar system. So that is a limitation in a way. And so hopefully as technology gets better, we'll be able to image smaller and smaller planets. Um, one other caveat is that the planets we're imaging right now, they have to be young. Um, so that means that they're still bright in the infrared where we're looking. So we're not actually looking in visible light. Um, we're looking in the infrared since we're looking for these planets that are still warm from when they formed. So they still retain all this heat from when they were forming and at infrared wavelengths, they're actually, you know, a little bit brighter than they are in visible wavelengths, at least compared to their star. So we look in the infrared to have a better chance at actually imaging these things. So in order for them to be bright in the infrared, they have to be young, and therefore we have to look at young planets. So there's only a very specific type of planet that can be imaged right now, but hopefully as technology gets better, we'll be able to see more and more kinds of planets. So what have we found? I've said it's hard, but I've said we found things. So what have we found? We've found 51 planets. And if you ever want to check up on this number, you can look at NASA's exoplanet archive that has regularly updated planet counts, which is pretty cool. So you can see the total number of exoplanets we've found on the day that I pulled this, which was about a week ago, um, was 4,341. It's a lot. Um, and 51 of them were discovered by um, imaging. And then you can see there's actually a breakdown for the different other different methods that are used, which is pretty cool. So if you're ever curious, I recommend you look at that. Back to what we found, 51 planets, and then some other things that aren't exactly planets. So we found brown dwarfs, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I think I have a doggy about to woof at me. Um, if you hear dog woofs, sorry in advance, whenever I'm talking to people, he thinks he needs to be talking too. Um, so brown dwarfs are another thing that we found, and I'll talk about those and why they're important in a second. Um, we've also found some binary stars, so stars that are in pairs. Um, and we've also found protoplanetary and debris disks. So these are the stages of forming planets. So we've actually been able to take a direct look into what's going on to form planets. So what's a brown dwarf anyways? I mentioned them and I said we'd talk about it. So brown dwarfs are the in-between, um, between planets and stars. So if we've got uh, red dwarf stars being the smallest, lowest mass stars, uh, then Jupiter being, you know, the biggest of the planets, basically, in between all of this is 
what we call a brown dwarf. So they're not big enough to actually start nuclear fusion in their cores and become a star, um, but they're also too big to be what we'd consider a planet. So brown dwarfs, they can't fuse hydrogen, but they can fuse heavy hydrogen or deuterium. And so they're this sort of transition between planets and stars. So they're really interesting for that reason. So why should we care about things that aren't planets and aren't stars? It's because they are the connection between the two. So they can help us answer questions about how planets evolve, how stars form, and what's going on in exoplanet atmospheres. So brown dwarfs, since they're bigger and easier to observe, we can actually look at weather and clouds and more in those kind of objects, and then take the lessons we've learned from that and apply them to planets. So now we're gonna go on a tour of some of the recently imaged objects, um, which should be pretty cool. So we've got here 51 Eridani B. So this is the lowest mass planet found from imaging. It's about two times the size of Jupiter. And you can clearly see its orbit, which is really neat. So this is an image taken with, uh, with an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, which um, my research group here at UCLA with Professor Mike Fitzgerald actually works on. Um, so this is the Gemini Planet Imager. So it's in Chile. Um, and it's this instrument here in the bottom of the telescope, and there's a picture of the telescope itself. So as we go through these different um, observations, I thought it'd be really neat to actually show the different telescopes that have found them. Um, so 51 Airy B, that image was from the Gemini Planet Imager. And then I've already talked about HR 8799. Um, so A is the star in the center, and then B, C, D, and E are the planets around it. And this can be thought of as like a scaled up outer solar system. So each of these planets is multiple times the mass of Jupiter, and they're double the distances of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, respectively. So this is a really well-studied system in direct imaging um, because it is multiple planets all in one system, which is really cool. And as you can see by the GIF, we've been observing it for over a decade now. So we have years of information on it, which is really awesome to see how these things are changing. And this image was from the Keck Observatory, which people at UCLA use quite often. So it's a major observatory in Hawaii and with these famous 10 meter telescopes. Um, it's done a lot of great science, um, far beyond just exoplanet imaging. All right, next tour stop is Kappa Andromeda B. So it's a planet so big, it might actually be a brown dwarf. Um, so it's estimated to be about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, which is pretty much what we consider the borderline between a brown dwarf and a planet. So this one is right on that borderline and we're still trying to figure out exactly where it lands. Um, so it's this little little blob up here um, and it's really far out from its, from its star. So the star is the cross in the center and the yellow circle here is where Neptune's orbit would be around that star. So this thing is way further than even Neptune. And this was found by the Subaru Telescope, which is run by the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and is located in Hawaii. Um, and it's uh, this image was done with a instrument called Skexeo, which is the Subaru Coronographic Extreme Adaptive Optics. So it has that adaptive optics part that I talked about earlier and a coronagraph, and it's a really you know extreme adaptive optic system. So it's cutting edge technology. So there's an image of with the AO off and with the AO on, and you can clearly see much more detail in the second one. All right, this is a really fun one. So Beta Pictoris B, we've got this planet, Beta Pictoris B, that is actually within this debris disk. So a debris disk is the remnants of planet formation where a bunch of you know little planetesimals that were left over are smacking into each other and con constantly making dust. And that dust is what makes up a debris disk. So we can see a planet that's actually within one of these debris disks. And Beta Pic B is at about an orbit, the same of like Saturn around its star. Um, and this is a really unique system because it's we've got images of both the disk and the planet. We can see how they fit together, which is really cool. And this image on the right, so this is actually two images of Beta Pic, but stacked on top of each other. So two images at different times stacked on top of each other. And so you can see 
on one of these images, we've seen Beta pick on one side of the star, and we've also seen it go all the way around to the other side in its orbit. So we can very clearly see this white circle is what its orbit would be. And that image was from the Very Large Telescope. So these are four eight meter telescopes that can actually be used together. Um, it's run by the European Southern Observatories and it's also located in Chile. All right, so this one isn't a planet, but it is a debris disk um, known as the Eye of Sauron. Um, I honestly just included it because it looks really neat. Um, and because there's actually two debris disks that are referred to as the Eye of Sauron. Um, so this one actually has a forming planet in it, which is extra cool. So this is Fomalhaut, and there's this little planet in here that for a while, uh, people were unclear if it was a planet or if it was just extra dust. But it looks like there is actually a planet in there that is orbiting, and so it's forming within this big debris disk, which is really cool. And then another forming planetary system. This is a fairly recent discovery. Um, it's called PDS-70b. So PDS-70b here um, has this big debris disk or big, pro big protoplanetary disk um, and this little blob of a forming planet inside of it. So this was discovered by, um, oops, sorry, the Very Large Telescope, which we mentioned earlier. So we might be, not be able to see these planets from our backyard, but what can we see? So let's take a break from the stuff that's far beyond what we can actually see with backyard telescopes or with our eyes and think about what's going on in the night sky right now. So I'm gonna switch over to Stellarium here. So right now, uh, Mars is pretty much the only evening planet that is visible. Um, so you can see right now, this uh, Stellarium simulation is pretty much what the night sky looks like right now here in Los Angeles. Um, and we've got Mars very clearly in the evening sky. Um, extra cool thing about Mars right now is that the Perseverance rover is actually landing on it tomorrow. So I highly encourage y'all to go watch the NASA live stream of that. Um, it starts around 11 a.m. Pacific time, and I think the landing is at about 1245, but you can see all of that information on NASA's website for the Mars 2020 mission. Um, this launched last summer, and it's so exciting that it is finally landing and is going to be looking for signs of life on Mars and other really cool science about the planet. So you can check out Mars in your evening sky. Um, it'll be in the general vicinity of the moon, but definitely also watch the NASA feed of the landing tomorrow. It's going to be really exciting. Um, right above Mars, we've also got another fun thing to look at in the sky, which is the Pleiades, so the Seven Sisters. Not a planet, but still a really fun thing to look at in the sky, especially if you're only using your eyes. So let's zoom up to the Pleiades. These are known as the Seven Sisters. Um, and it's this really cool open cluster of stars. So this is a fun one to look at. And then we've also got Orion is notably up in the sky right now. One of the easiest constellations to identify, at least I think so. That's one I can always find. Um, and I'm admittedly not awesome at finding constellations with just my eyes. Um, but Orion is up, it's bright, it's prominent. And you can see a lot of these bright stars in it. So you can see the two different sides of stellar evolution. So we've got a really old star in Betelgeuse here. So it's a red supergiant. Um, there was a bit of news about a year ago, I think, where people thought that Betelgeuse was showing signs of going supernova soon. Turns out, not going to be necessarily very soon in our time, but in astronomical time, maybe soon. Um, so that is an older star. And then at the bottom, you've got Rigel, which is bright and blue, and it's a very young star. Um, so it's cool to see these two opposites in the constellation of Orion. And then, of course, there's also the beautiful forming stars in the Orion Nebula, which is the sword hanging from the belt. Um, the Orion Nebula is a pretty famous one. And if you're lucky and if you're not in the most light polluted part of L.A., you can actually see this as a little smudge in the sky. So that's pretty cool. All right. So let's zoom back out and let's fast forward to morning because most of the planets right now are morning planets. So we'll see the sky, you know, things setting, the moon setting, and eventually planets will arise in the morning. And of course, this is not what we would see if we looked outside in Los Angeles right now because of light pollution. But if you're in a darker spot, you could see some of these things and even stuff like Orion shows up 
even here at UCLA um, where things are pretty bright. Okay, so about 6 a.m. is where the morning planets are gonna start to show up. So if we look towards the east-southeast, um, most of the planets are gonna show up around 6 a.m. So this is where we're gonna see Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter, and then Venus will tag along a little later, but unfortunately be mostly hidden by the sun right now. Okay, so these guys are gonna rise above the horizon. There we go. So at around 6.40ish in the morning, uh, this trio should be pretty visible just at the horizon. Um, if you have buildings in the way, unfortunately, you might not be able to see them, but we've got Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, Saturn with its big, beautiful rings. So if you have binoculars or a telescope, uh, you could see the rings of Saturn, and then Jupiter, which is another really fun one to look through a telescope. But unfortunately, since they're only visible in the morning right now, it'll be pretty hard to see them. And definitely don't use a telescope if, it, if the sun is rising. Um, you might be able to get a glimpse of Venus with just your naked eye um, because it's one of the you know brightest planets. It's one of our closest neighbors and it's also got those really reflective clouds. So it's a good target to look at. Unfortunately, right now it doesn't rise until it's pretty close to the sun. So the chance of seeing this guy right now is not too great, unfortunately. But most of the planets are morning planets right now, but you can definitely see Mars very clearly at night. Um, and while you're looking at it, think about the fact that a robot that we sent all the way there is about to land, which is incredible. So back to the exoplanets. So what comes next for exoplanets? What comes next for imaging these exoplanets? New space telescopes are going to be revolutionary for this, and so are new bigger ground-based telescopes. So we're both going to send things to space and have things here on the ground that are going to help us image a whole bunch of new planets, hopefully. So some exciting upcoming space missions. The James Webb Space Telescope is a big one. So people have been saying it's going to launch for a while now. It's faced a lot of delays, but the current launch date is targeted for October 31st of this year, which is really exciting. So as long as James Webb launches this year, we're going to get so much exciting science in the next year. So it's got a 6.5 meter mirror, so it's much bigger than Hubble. Um, and it's looking in the infrared, which is good for looking at dusty things, so like uh, protoplanetary disks and debris disks, and also far away things, so things that are from very early in the universe and are redshifted. Um, that doesn't really apply to planets, but it's going to be cool anyways. Um, one of the things that James Webb is going to do is it's not as much about the exoplanet imaging necessarily, but it is going to be able to do a lot of transit spectroscopy. So that means getting spectra of planets um, that are transiting. So it might not be directly imaging, but we'd still get that information about what their atmospheres are made of, and that's going to be really cool. Um, and two of its instruments will also have coronagraphs for imaging, so it could be able to do a little bit of that too. Um, WFIRST, which is now known as the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, um, is one of the next upcoming space missions. So it's 2.4 meters, so it's the same as Hubble. Um, and it's got a wide field of view, so 100 times larger than Hubble's field of view. So it's going to be able to do a lot of cool science beyond exoplanets. Um, but it will also be able to do exoplanet science. So it's going to have a coronagraph that will hopefully see planets a billion times fainter than their stars. Um, for context, Earth is 10 billion times fainter, and right now we're doing about in the millions. So it'll be more than we are, it'll be better than we're doing now, um, but not quite enough to see um, Earth's necessarily. Louvoir is actually a mission concept, so it's not a like selected plant mission yet. It's contingent on funding, and if it's chosen as one of NASA's flagship missions, um, but if it is chosen, it would launch in the 2030s, hopefully. And Louvoir would be like bonkers revolutionary for astronomy. So Louvoir would be huge. Its name is actually the Large Ultraviolet Optical and Infrared Telescope. And by huge, I mean this. So Hubble was 2.4 meters. It got us all sorts of incredible images and so much science, like the famous Hubble Deep Field and basically all of the gorgeous images you can think of. A lot of those came from Hubble. And James Webb is already going to be a big step up in mirror size from that. And the proposed mirror for Louvoir is this whopping 16 meters that makes even James Webb look small. And mirror size is important because essentially the bigger the telescope, the fainter the things you can see and the better resolution you can get. So since we're 
our whole thing is like we're collecting light in order to magnify it. We need a bigger light bucket to collect all the light we can. And Luvar would be huge. Um, it would be considered like the next Hubble because it's multi-wavelength like Hubble was. It'd be looking in the ultraviolet, optical, and infrared. Um, and because of that huge 15 meter mirror, um, it would be able to do so many cool things. So for example, this picture on the bottom is what um, Hubble's picture of Enceladus looked like uh, versus a simulation of what Enceladus would look like through Louvoir, where you can resolve surface features and these plumes, and it would be amazing. Um, and then they, it's also going to have a coronagraph with a goal to find Earth-like exoplanets. So this is a simulated image of what um, our solar system would look like, but seen through from far away through Louvoir. So you'd be able to not only resolve Jupiter, but even Venus and Earth so close in. So this would be a really incredible mission if it's chosen and funded. Another cool mission concept is HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet mission. So its entire thing would be looking for habitable exoplanets. So this is a planet-specific mission, whereas the last couple I talked about were all, you know, more general purpose, going to do a lot of different astronomy things. HABEX's is focus is planets. So it's a four-meter telescope, not huge, still bigger than Hubble. Um, and it would have a coronagraph within the telescope it could use, but also this big star shade that it could use as a coronagraph that orbits separately from the spacecraft. So that's one of the things that's really unique about this mission concept. And that would allow it to look for habitable Earth-like planets. And then there's cool things happening on the ground too, like so many cool things happening on the ground. So our current major planet finders are, you know, Keck that we talked about um, in Hawaii, the Very Large Telescope in Chile, and Gemini South in Chile. So those are circled here in the green circles. And again, they look tiny compared to what's coming next, which is the extremely large telescopes, or the ELTs. So there's the 30-meter telescope planned originally for also on Mauna Kea, but that might not turn out uh, to actually be the true plan that happens. Um, there's, that's still a little up in the air. And then there's the Giant Magellan Telescope, uh, which would also be in Chile, and the European Extremely Large Telescope, which would also be in Chile. So these ELTs are all about 30 meters across is their, is their thing. Um, and that would be a huge, huge difference compared to what we have now. So the first of these projects is the 30 meter telescope, also known as TMT. So this is a collaboration between the United States um, and a couple other nations, including India, China, Japan, and Canada. Um, and its location is question mark, maybe Mauna Kea, um, but there's been this very uh, public, you know, discourse about native Hawaiians actually having pushed back to this land being used in that way. So hopefully everyone will be able to, you know, come to some sort of agreement, whether it's to not build the telescope there or and build it somewhere else or some agreement to actually use that land in Hawaii. I don't actually know how that's going to turn out, but um, I hope we find a way to respect the culture of the native people there and also have this astronomy, you know, be enabled by this awesome telescope. Um, and it, its original planned completion was like the late 2020s. That timeline may be a little bit different because of the land battles that have been going on in Hawaii. Um, I encourage you all to read up on that if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Definitely a good conversation about ethics and astronomy. Um, and even if TMT is a little delayed, there are these two other projects that are going forward already. So there's the Extremely Large Telescope, which is the European version, essentially, of TMT. Um, so it's run by the European Southern Observatory and will be located in Chile in the Atacama Desert, where a lot of these other really famous telescopes are. Um, and its planned completion is 2025. So that would be very, very exciting. And then last but not least, there's the Giant Magellan Telescope, which the U.S. is also a partner in. Um, and this one would also be in the south, so this would be in Chile. So there's multiple international partners on this one too, the US, Australia, Brazil, and South Korea. Um, and it's planned for completion also in the late 2020s. So these are all things that are happening in like the next decade, hopefully, that should enable a bunch of really cool new science. And plus, we're always working on better technology for the instruments we already have and for the telescopes that we already have. So for example, uh, I know a bunch of people at UCLA and Caltech are working on something called KPIC which is the Keck Planet Imager and Characterizer. And so it's a new instrument for those Keck 10 meter telescopes um, that's using the existing infrastructure and building off of that in order to enable new science. So that's really awesome. So in conclusion, there is a ton to look forward to when it comes to exoplanets. Um, 
we have so much going on in technology and in, you know, understanding more of how these things form and the theory behind them. And there's going to be so much exciting discovery of planetary systems outside of our solar system in the next few decades. I know I'm excited about it and I hope y'all are too. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can pop them in the chat. Uh, I wanted to keep it short tonight because I know we're all tired of watching things on the internet, but thank you for being here. Um, and if you have any questions, I would love to chat and answer them. So throw them in the chat and I will gladly answer. And if there are no questions, thank you so much for being here tonight. I know we all spend a lot of time on the computer, but I hope this was a fun uh, educational experience. Um, a nice distraction from everything going on. Mm, that's a good question. Um, in the chat, someone asked, why are there so many telescopes placed in Chile? So in the Atacama Desert, it's just this really like optimal site for these telescopes. So it's a really high location, so you don't have to deal with as much of the atmosphere, um, and it's really dry, which is good for telescopes. So the Atacama Desert is where a lot of these telescopes are. So all the ones that are in Chile are pretty much in the Atacama Desert, um, just because it makes for better observations. Um, I don't think I have a favorite exoplanet. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think HR 8799 is a cool one just because we have all those, you know, we have all that data on its orbit. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a favorite. If I find one, that would be my favorite, but I haven't done that yet. Um, someone else asked, have we seen a star become a planet? Um, no, that is not really a thing that happens. So stars are, you know, going to be too big. They evolve totally differently than planets. Um, so things don't really get you know, smaller like that. If a star was to get smaller, it would just be a smaller star. Um, or eventually would just like, if you stripped off all the outer layers of a star, you'd be left with like the core, which would be end up being a white dwarf. Um, so stars are like totally different. They can't like become planets. Um, someone else asked, what's the biggest star that we found an exoplanet around? Um, and I don't actually know. Um, I think we typically look a lot at for transits, we look at sun-like stars just because then they would, you know, be more like what we know about. Um, a lot of people look around small M dwarf stars because, you know, those stars are dimmer and smaller. And so it's easier to see planets around them um, with pretty much all the different methods we've got. Um, so I don't know how many people look at like the biggest, brightest stars. I know for imaging, we do look at brighter stars because it makes it easier on the adaptive optics system. Um, but I don't know what the biggest star is. Um, and then someone else asked, if you had a gazillion dollars, what research would you do? Oh, I would just like build a teles like a space telescope like Louvoir so we could do all that solar system science and, you know, actually, uh, yeah, do everything with that. Um, I would also love to actually, you know, build more missions to the outer solar system planets. Like, this is a more realistic proposal, but I would love to see a, a space mission go to Uranus and Neptune because they haven't been visited since the Voyager missions. So they're like the least well-studied planets in our solar system. Like Pluto's had a mission to it because it's you know, an interesting like dwarf planet. Um, but Uranus and Neptune really only have, you know, the stuff from Voyager. So yeah, if I had unlimited money, I would build a telescope like Wouvoir. I mean, I would fund all of my collaborators because I love them and I want them to have stable careers um, <laughs> and not have to worry about finding funding. Um, and yeah, that I would definitely fund an outer solar system mission. Um, yeah. It's hard to think about what it would be like to have a gazillion dollars. That's not something that generally happens in research. Um, at least this kind of research. Um, yeah, there's a lot I would want to do. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, those were great questions. Uh, so I'll wait around a few more minutes just in case anyone else has any other comments 
Um, but other than that, I hope you have a great night. And if you're watching this, you know, at a future time, I hope you had fun too. All right. All right, thanks so much everyone for the nice comments. Um, I'm gonna close out the stream now. So thank you all for being here. It's been great.